time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. Here we are among all our inventions. We have eyeglasses and we have language. We have pens, pens and paper. And we have writing, we have writing. I'm writing my name and we have books. Wonderful things are books. We've got bananas and bicycles and flashlights, also known as torches. We've got binoculars to help us see into the future. Also, we have telescopes and surfboards and hula hoops and ladders. And we've turned grass into bread. Hmm. And we've turned wolves into dogs. <laughs> Where did all this stuff come from? When did we invent all this stuff? Time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. Time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. I'm a human being. You're a human being. We have stuff. We have eyeglasses. We have clothes. We have a microphone, a slide advancer. But this wasn't always the case. Earlier than about 10,000 years ago, all human beings on this planet were hunters and gatherers. And we had things like bows and arrows, and we would shoot deer, and then we'd kill the deer and, and eat it. And we'd gather tubers and anything, fruits that we could find around the place. But about 10,000 years ago, we became, some, some populations on Earth started doing agriculture. And they started living in cities because the agriculture provided food surplus. And we also started uh, domesticating cattle and other things. And this transition from hunting and gathering to cities and agriculture is called the Neolithic Revolution. And it happened somewhere between uh, about 10,000 BC to about 3,000 BC. And so here are some people, here's some Egyptians cutting the wheat to make that agricultural surplus so they could have big cities like Luxor. And here's modern agriculturalists, uh, I guess, watering, irrigating their rice fields. And what about these first cities? Now, some of the first cities in the world is, one of them is right here, Gobekli Tepe. And then there's another city that I visited, Ketelhuyuk. It's a lovely city. It's a big hill. It's just the ruins of a city, actually. But it's on a hill surrounded by plains where there were, where there were fields. And now if you go into the, Tigre, the Mesopotamia between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, you'll see lots of cities, and in particular you see this Ur city, which, if you look carefully, used to be on the coastline of the Persian Gulf because the Persian Gulf, instead of being here, was further in about 5,000 years ago. Now, what do these cities look like? This old one that I pointed out is 11,000 before the present, and this was before pottery, metals, writing, or the wheel, and it's called Gobekli Tepe. It's in current-day Turkey, and this was... There's a guy named Klaus Schmidt who excavated here, and he said, you know what, this is a hunter-gatherer temple. This is not a, a post-Neolithic Revolution temple because the people there, they, had, they didn't look like they were living there. Their wheat genomes had come from nearby, but they weren't domesticated. And so his conclusion was that the, first came the temple and then the city. Katalhuyuk on the right is a bona fide city where they could be there because they had domesticated and, uh, crops and had agriculture. Well, then there's Ur. This is an aerial photograph of Ur in Mesopotamia on the left, and there's Luxor in Egypt, Teotihuacan in Mexico, Mohenjo-daro in the Indus Valley, and if you want to know where that is, look at the map in the lower right. It's right in the middle of that green area in current-day Pakistan. So these are some of the first cities. Here's one, a more modern city, Nuremberg, and uh, here's a more modern, another modern city. Well, you can see, uh, imagine all the people there. they got to eat. Where's that food coming from? It's got to come from the, the, the agriculture around it that gets transported into the city. Now, what, this farming that had to start in order to produce cities, where did farming, where did agriculture start? And so here's a map of when agricultural, agricultural started. And you can see in the lower left the time frame from 1000 BC to 3000, 3000 to 5000, 5000, 7000. And the earliest regions that had agriculture from 7,000 to 9,000 BC are marked in red. And you can see that they're kind of spread all over the world. They're kind of independent. And so most people who look at this say, you know what, agriculture and farming uh, was invented independently in these regions. 
But I'm skeptical of this idea for the following reason. When the record of the past is good, the age of the oldest evidence for something is a good estimate of its origin. Yes, but much more often the record of the past is sparse. Then the oldest evidence for something is usually much younger than the origin. The origin can be much older. So the idea here is that maybe agriculture started in a kind of proto way, maybe 10,000, 11,000, 12,000, maybe even 20,000 BC, but it was only in one place. And then it kind of spread very slowly, spread very slowly, and then it became more and more important. And when it became important, it started to leave traces. And then we see these traces and say, ah, they invented it independently. That would be an uh, inappropriate conclusion, I think. So thus, it's hard to answer the question, did X evolve once in a particular place and time, or did X evolve multiple times in different places independently? It's difficult because the earliest evidence for something in, with sparse evidence is not where things got started. It's, uh, we have a problem. Same thing with fossils. Here's a map, for example, of the domestication of plants and animals all over the world and where things were first domesticated. There's tobacco, for example, first domesticated in North America. But if you look carefully, you'll see that in eastern Brazil, they have tobacco down there, too. So the people who made this map think that tobacco maybe was domesticated twice independently from, I don't know, wild tobacco that was all over the New World. Or let's, it could have been domesticated first in North America and then spread and spread and spread and then spread to eastern Brazil. They did it there. And then when they started to put a map together, they said, oh, it's done in two places. It's two independently. So it's hard to tell. I, th I suspect in North America, the first tobacco, maybe in Mesoamerica. I do not know. But think about rice. Rice, too, is listed twice here, once in West Africa and once in Southeastern Asia. Maybe it was first done in Southeastern Asia and then it spread to West Africa. But that spread happened before we have evidence for it in southeastern Asia. What about domestication of animals? Here's a cattle and getting some good milk from it, making some ice cream. <laughs> well, where did cattle come from? Well, in the Mediterranean, they have cattle listed, but they also have cattle listed in southwest Asia, in current uh, around Iran, for example. So maybe cattle was domesticated first somewhere in that region, and we're not quite sure. But uh, how about pig? Pig West Africa, Southeast Asia? Who knows? Was there a wild pig that was all over the place and then they got domesticated independently? Or was it one domesticated thing that kind of spread? It's uh, hard to say. Uh, but the dog is a little bit easier to say because we've done genetic studies on it. And this map here is wrong. To say that the dog was domesticated in Mesoamerica is just wrong because we know that the dog was domesticated about 30,000 years ago. From that, we know that the first people who came to the New World through the Bering Straits already had dogs, so they didn't domesticate it in Mesoamerica. Uh, where in the Old World uh, dogs were domesticated is a little bit hard to say, but we do know that it was about 30,000 years ago, and it came from this gray wolf. So all the dogs alive today were domesticated versions of this gray wolf that was, a, was uh, I guess, an ancestor about 30,000 years ago. Cats are a little bit interesting. They're, they were, we say that they're domesticated about 11,000 years ago, but really I don't think they're domesticated. They were just following the mice and rats that were following the agricultural surpluses. And so uh, cats were not, have, not, have never been domesticated. They just live around us. Cattle, about 11,000 years ago, they're domesticated from wild cattle and horses about 4,000 years ago. So domesticating of, domesticating of animals and plants was something important for what we did. How about writing? If you travel around the world, you'll see different types of alphabets. You'll see the Latin alphabet or the Roman alphabet in the silver, or I guess that's the gray regions. And if you go to the green countries, you'll see the Arabic alphabet. If you go to Russia, you'll see the Cyrillic alphabet. If you go to China, you see the Chinese alphabet and Korea, Hangul. Anyway, there are different other types of alphabets around the world. And you could ask the question, where did writing come from? What's the origin of writing? Well, it, like everything, it's a little bit complicated, but you can see traces. For example, in the earliest writing, didn't look like letters. They looked like the things in the upper left. These are kind of like little pictures of hands and feet and rocking chairs or something. And then cuneiform was very early, and then hieroglyphics in the lower left. And uh, also in the upper right, that's, a, that's Herodotus, one of the first, that's Greek there. And we were writing on papyrus. They came in scrolls, and then books were invented, and now we have electronic books. Right in the middle is the Rosetta Stone that was found in about 1799 in a place called Rosetta in, uh, in Upper Egypt, no, in uh, well, the, Nile, the Nile Delta. And in the lower part, you can see Greek. 
in the middle is demotic and in the upper part is hieroglyphic. So it was a translation of the same text in these three different languages which allowed us to figure out what hieroglyphics were saying. So writing is a powerful thing. So in summary, 12,000 years ago we had a Neolithic revolution, agriculture and animal husbandry. 5,000 years ago there were the first kingdoms, first writing, first money, polytheism. Earlier than polytheism we had animism, I guess. Money was invented, I guess, about 2,500 years ago, scientific revolution about 500 years ago, and then 200 years ago, the Industrial Revolution. So that's a summary of the, uh, the last 12,000 years of human, human uh, culture, I guess. So if you're a historian, you think history starts with writing because you need to have written documents to talk about history. And before writing, you have prehistory. And that's how historians divide up uh, human progress. Let's talk about the evolution of seeing, for example. That's a good example. Look at these guy about 13 B, uh, AD in uh, northern Italy. He has a pair of glasses he puts on so he could read better. And then uh, here's Galileo showing the Pope how to look through a telescope about 400 years ago. And here's a telescope 100, 200 years later. And then here's a more modern telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope out in outer space. So telescopes, incredible progress has been made over the last 400 years during the scientific revolution. Microscope, same thing. This is a microscope, the first one, by Leeuwenhoek about 400 years ago. And then we have a modern microscope and then even a more modern microscope, all kinds of different ones that they get really fancy depending on what you want to look at. So lots of progress has been made here. Here's a guy named Maxwell who has the Maxwell's equations. And these equations essentially predicted that the spectrum that we see, the rainbow from blue to red, is only a tiny fraction of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, which on the far left, very long, long wavelengths, that's radio. And on the far right, gamma rays, very, very, very short. And if you want to know how short, it's listed there on the top. But when, since these things exist and we can't see them, we have to develop instruments to see them. And about 100 years ago, we have Jansky here with the first radio telescope. <laughs> it looks kind of squarish there. But then we have more modern radio telescopes. And we can make telescopes that can see in the microwave. Here's what a modern looks like, one. And then we can also see in x-rays. And here are two people kissing in x-rays. And we have gamma ray telescopes and UV telescopes and infrared telescopes. But any particular portion of this of electromagnetic spectrum, we have instruments that allow us to see in that frequency range. Isn't that wonderful? Now, this is all, now more recently, we have the Industrial Revolution where we have big wheels and cranks and making ships and cars. And this is uh, Charlie Chaplin trying to adjust just, just something. And here's what the Industrial Revolution looks like. You got a bunch of people making widgets all lined up and beep, got to work. Oh, off break, got to break now. And 2000 BC, this is a map of the world of where hunters and gatherers were. And remember, this is before the Industrial Revolution. This was mostly before agriculture. Um, 10,000 years ago, everybody was yellow on this map. But then there was some agriculture that grew up. We have hunter-gatherers in yellow, nomadic pastoralists in purple. We have simple farming in green. We have complex farming in orange. And then we have state societies in blue. So it's kind of like organizing the world. And then a thousand years later, hunter-gatherers have been marginalized a little bit in yellow and then pastoralists and farming spread around. And then today, 2000 AD, hunters and gatherer populations that are surviving are indicated here in the red dot. And uh, so the idea is hunting gathering, some populations have remained hunters and gatherers. So we can ask the question, would a Neolithic revolution that happened in some populations 10,000 years ago, would it happen again if we could replay the tape of, of culture. If we could go back 20,000 or 30 or 50,000 years into the past and then let things happen, would this Neolithic revolution happen again? Not all humans groups have gone through a Neolithic revolution. Those are the remaining hunters and gatherers. Maybe the ones that have got it from a single source. And that leads us to the question, was the Neolithic revolution a unique cultural thing or something that one should expect or should have expected? Now, a nice perspective on this comes from our friends, the social insects. Here's an ant, and what this ant is doing is agriculture. Ants started farming about 50 million years ago, and if you're keeping track, that's 50 million years before humans started farming. There were not even any humans around. <laughs> they were, we were shrews at this time. Here's the ants doing the agriculture. I think these are leaf-cutting ants. Now, 
They're also making cities. Social insects are making cities. What this is, is this is in Brazil. They took an, a termite mound, a termite city, filled it with cement, and now they're digging and excavating away all the dirt to see what the city looked like, and that's what it looks like. It's a giant city. And also, ants domesticate other animals. On the left, you can see an ant milking an aphid, and what's coming out of that aphid's anus is this ball of sugary liquid, which the ant is drinking. And the aphid is on the right, too, in the jaws of an ant. So 50 million years ago, before humans, social insects had agriculture, cities, and domesticated animals. And because of that, does this mean that the Neolithic Revolution happened independently twice on Earth, and therefore we should expect it to happen elsewhere in the universe? How much like us are the aliens? Should we expect Stone Age aliens, for example? Just as Stone Age aliens went through a Neolithic, I'm sorry, just as Stone Age humans went through a Neolithic Revolution, shouldn't we expect aliens to have gone through a Stone Age and then a Neolithic Revolution on their way to developing their own advanced technology in the same way that we think we did or we know we did. As a footnote, we humans were living in the Stone Age from about 3 million years ago to 10,000 years ago. And if you're keeping track, that's about a thousand times longer than we've been out of the Stone Age, than we've been literate. So would science evolve again? I'm a scientist, and so I think science is great. But if we replayed the tape of human culture, would science evolve again? Human hunter-gatherers had been around for a very, very long time without science. So we can ask the question, is the transition from hunter-gatherer to science inevitable, given enough time? I do not know the answer to that. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question, but it's a question that we would like to know the answer to because we're trying to ask the same questions about aliens. Will the aliens be Stone Age humans, or will they have science, and uh, what will they develop? Another question we might ask that's pertinent to our future is, after World War III, if there are survivors, will our, so these survivors know how to make fire, and will they want to make fire? Will they wear clothes? I don't know. All of these inventions allow us to look for aliens. And at the same time, they tell us what we should be looking for, aliens with inventions, because we're really looking for ourselves. We should be looking for telescopes and parking lots and cars and the Internet, and we should be looking for devices like this iPhone. I am not your device. Siri, what did you say? I am not your device. You are my device. Mm-hmm.